All right, viewers. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good day and welcome to another interesting um, episode of Global Arena on my YouTube channel, Global Arena TV. I'm your host, Omar Isa Nandago. Let me start by asking our viewers some very interesting rhetorical questions. Number one, do you read books? How many have you so far read? If the answer is no, then why is reading culture massively declining and is social media partly or wholly uh, to blame for that well my guest today is someone very special and global arena tv is very much lucky to have her on the show uh, professor teresa kremin is a popular academic highly revered in her field and in the uk at large professor Tre uh, professor teresa has made significant contributions to the field of literacy education through her research, teaching, and advocacy efforts. Uh, Professor Kremin is known for her work in promoting literacy, uh, literacy development, particularly in early childhood education, and for her emphasis on fostering a love for reading and writing in young learners. While well, Professor Teresa Kremin uh, a researcher, an educator, and an author joins me right now via Zoom from the United Kingdom. Thank you enormously for sparing your precious time to be on Global Arena. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Mark. It's good to be here. Good to discuss these important issues. Yeah, yeah, it's a pleasure. The pleasure is mine. Of course, like I said in my introduction, um, we are very much lucky to have you. Uh, and thank you for uh, for taking time out uh, to be with us at this late hours. We are recording um, on the 15th of May and today is Wednesday at about 7 p.m. Um, in the evening. Professor must have been um, uh, engaged in a lot of activity um, uh, during the daytime. That's why she has chosen uh, this time to be with us. Uh, without further ado, let's before diving deeply into the cracks of the discussion, let's get to know something about you. Who is Professor Teresa Kremin? Who am I? Um, I'm an ex-educator, a teacher, so I'm still an educator in that sense, but I was a full-time teacher in primary classrooms for many, many years. Uh, and then I went into teacher education uh, and started training teachers, helping teachers develop the skills to become the teachers of tomorrow, the reading teachers of tomorrow. So I focused on literacy uh, mainly. Uh, and then gradually during that 18 years in Canterbury, in Kent, working with student teachers, I developed a master's course, took my own uh, PhD and began to work um, to support uh, teachers who are already trained, who are having professional development training. Uh, and then I began to develop my own research work uh, more widely, put in bids and uh, got some income to externally funded research bids and began to find out more to contribute to the agenda by not having the answers, but by finding out a bit more about what motivates young readers and what motivates young writers, uh, and to read around that. And then I moved to the Open University, where I am now, very happily, since 2007. Uh, so I'm quite, I'm not one of these characters in education who moves around a lot. I yeah. put my feet down on the table, commit to the institution and become an ambassador for them. Well, that, that's uh, great. You said you have been a teacher uh, for a very long period of time. Did you ever teach uh, at primary level and secondary level, then you moved to the university, or you just started um, as a university lecturer after finishing your... No, I definitely started in primary classrooms, yes. So my roots are in teaching uh, 5 to 11-year-olds, really. I've taught a little bit in secondary, but mostly in 5 to 11-year-olds. Um, how significant is it for for someone who wants to become a professor to start teaching from primary school, right from primary school uh, or elementary, as they call it in the United States of America, right from the basic, from the scratch? I, I do think if you were a teacher, a full-time teacher in classrooms, regardless of the age of the children, it, it gives you another kind of angle on the research insights and becoming a professor. So my commitment is not to be finding out new knowledge that is going to go in a fabulous journal or be published in a book and nobody reads. If you're going to find out new knowledge, it needs to be relevant to the world, in my view. And that's because as a teacher, I wanted to read 
material and resource material, advice, practical strategies, as well as research that help me help the kids. So our remit as professors is not just to contribute to new knowledge and support colleagues in so doing, but to create new knowledge that can be applied, explored, uh, developed in classrooms. Uh, and that's partly why, um, Uma, a lot of my research has been with teachers rather than on them. So I work alongside teachers and bring teachers into the projects I'm working on so that I learn from them as well as they're potentially learning from me and through the research experience. So it's a collaborative, co-partnership yeah. agenda. How did that uh, primary experience, primary school teaching experience help you? How has it helped you throughout your career? It's, I think it's always directed me towards the consequence of knowledge. So what's the point of finding out unless we can apply it? So it's directed my thinking towards making the new insights that one might gain from research be potential to be applied. So it made me focused on impact, on the impact of any new knowledge. How do we mediate that with the profession and how do we help the profession develop their practice so that it makes more difference to the children? So you become quite child-centered, really. Research may be about children and about teachers, but the purpose is to enrich the education of all. But teaching children is something very hard and some people find it boring um, and tedious because you, you, you're dealing with children. You have to also, uh, with their own craziness, you have to also level down, come down to their level and become sort of like a child playing with them. I mean, how tedious was it for you? And Absolutely not tedious at all. I do not think teaching children is boring. I think it's electric, engaging. Now, if you get to know them as humans, what a difference that makes. If they get to know you, I mean, you're making new relationships with people in the world and you're potentially making a difference to their life chances. If you're a good educator, you're shaping their future for tomorrow. You're contributing to... Uh, re redressing some of the social inequalities in our many systems right across the world. So we can make a difference as educators if we know how. Uh, and that's what I'm re researching, how to make more of a difference so that we can um, support young children as they grow. So, no, I have to push back. Not boring at all. I loved it. I still love it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It seems they did not give you a headache. No. Sure. I mean... You know, some days it's very noisy, isn't it? But then if you and I and 10 friends were having a drink or were sitting around, then we'd be making noise too. So children are allowed to make noise. You know, sure. they're, they're human. Yeah, sure, of course. So let, let's move on. You said you are currently working um, at the Open University. In Nigeria here, we also have our National Open University of Nigeria, uh, which is sort of a, a distant learning university thing. Um, you register, they give you materials, you go and read, and their title here is a work and learn. That's that's their slogan. Uh, it's normally meant for those who are working and then want to further their education. They can do degree, master's, and um, in some areas, a PhD. Um, uh, recently, one of my mentors, in fact, my biggest mentor, Professor Abdullah Uba Adam, um, served as a vice chancellor of the university from 2016. I think to 2021 or, or thereabouts. Um, how does your open university work? Does it work like ours or there are physical classes? In, in a not dissimilar manner, it is a distance learning institution. Uh, but uh, the there's kind of our key tenets are about being open to people, uh, open to our, and being open to ideas. Yeah. Uh, so critically. Uh, we're involved in welcoming all at a very inclusive uh, institution. And so we do run many, many distance learning uh, classes and courses uh, and degrees for many um, people of all ages, very popular in uh, the England, but also the UK and right across the world. Uh, colleagues can take degrees with us and courses with us. There is a um, and clearly elements of that work that are face to face, that are interactive. And the work I've been doing most recently uh, in, in outfacing the research findings have been more with teachers, both online and in face-to-face -face conferences, in face-to-face -face, um, um, uh, courses in various ways. So quite a, quite a mixture. But when COVID hit, uh, we were, as I suspect you were in, in Nigeria in the online university, we were very well positioned to support learners who wanted to move forward because our distance learning courses were already online. Okay, uh, that's great. Let, let's now move on to the um, 
areas that you've been um, researching into. Talk to us briefly about the researches, some of the most important, because you have done a lot of researches, some of the most important topics you have been able to cover. I have read it and watched uh, a couple of videos on YouTube that you are very much interested in the issue of uh, reading for pleasure, especially among children. Um, talk us through yeah. this and uh, a couple of others. Okay, I will do. So in terms of reading for pleasure, I mean, it, it struck me as a teacher early on uh, that we can teach the children all the skills of reading. We can enable them to learn to read and they can decode, uh, they can comprehend. But whether they choose to read is another matter. So mm -hmm. many children develop the skills of reading, but they don't choose to read. They don't choose to develop the, that desire or they're not enabled to develop the desire to read. So in our country, reading for pleasure is deemed to be volitional reading, recreational reading. And there is lots of international evidence now that shows that being a recreational reader, being a reader in your childhood, is going to make quite a lot of difference uh, to your trajectory, to your life journey. Uh, it will contribute to a wider comprehension, to wider attainment in reading and right across the curriculum, and it can contribute to your well-being. And so it's a really important space to get right to help educators understand well, how can we better motivate children to read. And so my research has been around that what kind of classroom climate, what kind of pedagogy, what kind of teacher knowledge is needed in order to help young children choose to read. And when they choose to read, read regularly, talk to their friends about it, they're motivated, they're engaged, they're socially interactive, and they're benefiting by going home to read in the evening, 10 minutes, an hour, 40 minutes, whatever they want to do. Not what I've set as teacher, but what they're choosing to do. And in effect, Dumas, those young people are giving themselves every night a lesson, an extra lesson. They're going to school again. Only they don't see it as school. They see it as the next exciting chapter in the story yeah? or finding out about the football results. Mm. They're choosing to read and valuing that uh, choosing. And that makes, makes a big difference. So a lot of my time has been spent trying to understand that better to help the profession. Uh, you, you're not talking about the books that are prescribed to them by their teachers. You are talking about um, what what they are interested to read, aside from apart from uh, their normal lessons, uh, books, yes. and so on and so forth. That's what you would have reading for pleasure? Self-chosen books that are uh, around their interests. Uh, the teacher might have promoted a range of them, but the child gets to choose because they're the reader. Mm. I couldn't make you, Umar, love a particular author. I couldn't make you, and you couldn't make me. You could tempt me. You could model. You could entice. You could invite. Yeah? You could read aloud some to me, but you can't make me love them. Mm. Because the author you might recommend could be always writing sci-fi, for example. Well, Teresa, I don't like sci-fi. So mm. it's going to be a really hard job, mate, because I'm just not going to want to read it. So nobody can make another reader be required to read but we can invite and engage. And if we're going to motivate readers, motivation is malleable. We can work with motivation and we can give the children the skills. What we want them to do is having both the skill to read and the will. And those two work in a, a reciprocal relationship. The more skilled you become as a reader, the more you develop that desire to read if you're supported to develop that desire to read. Some children are very skilled, but they don't do it. Yeah. I don't need that. I've got technology. I've got football. I've got something else in my life. Don't need reading. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're then disadvantaged, really. They're shortchanged. They're not going to achieve as high attainment. They're not going to develop a strong well-being because the relationship's really clear. It's not causational. It's correlational, the data, but it shows there is a strong relationship between reading and attainment, read, choosing to read, loving reading and attainment, and loving reading and well-being. I mean, uh, it, it, your last point um, sounds a little bit confusing, not only to me, but maybe to a couple of other people. Are okay. you trying to relate success to reading? Are you trying to say that the more you read, the more successful you are likely to become in the future? I don't know that we can say, we haven't got data that suggests you're successful, but we have got data that suggests that your attainment will be en en enhanced that your well-being will be enhanced, that you will have a wider vocabulary, that you will have a richer comprehension. Now, all of those features, particularly the academic features, will feed in to your exam results at whatever age the, the child is taking exams. 
And we know that there are statistics that show, certainly in the UK, that those exam results relate to your later economic, your likely economic income. Mm. Yeah. There's also research with older people that shows that those who love reading live longer and have a stronger sense of well-being. So developing a love of reading, being a reader who actively reads, can have serious consequences for you know, later benefits, as it were, in life. Uh, economic benefits is not a direct, you know, causal motorway, but it is definitely a very strong association. All right. So if, if somebody wants to attain a particular position in life, either a social position or political or an academic one, then they should start engaging in reading right from the beginning. Absolutely. But because then, they, yes. think about it. you might be reading a book about pollution right. and the, the book is a story book and you're nine. And you're not, it's not a non-fiction book, it's a storybook, but pollution is woven through the storybook. Mm. As you read that storybook, you're learning more about plastics mm. and the ocean and what, why not, to what are the consequences for multiple species that live in the ocean. So you're widening your conceptual understanding. You're also bringing uh, to the next piece of uh, text that you're reading or a piece of writing, you're bringing new vocabulary, new knowledge and understanding. So... As a reader who's keenly reading regularly, you're developing a richer conceptual understanding of the world around you. And that will going to benefit you. That clearly is going to. But, but then, for example, are you trying to say that uh, if someone wants to become a climate change expert or yeah, climate change expert scholar in the future, then uh, the books that they should be reading for in the beginning, when they are a child, when they are growing up, should, should be related to that area no I, I what i'm trying to say is reading for pleasure is always about choice mm. so as a young person we need to respect their choices now you know a seven-year-old won't know what they want to be later in life unusual yeah what we want them to be is a reader a reader who chooses i'm fascinated by dinosaurs or i love fairy stories or i love her stories that make me sad mm. even though it's reading for pleasure you know emotional engagement Mm. And so choosing to read whatever the text is going to be widening. So it's not a, a direct route between your subject interest early on and your later. But you find, we find from interviews with um, people who have achieved highly in their lives, uh, it, they were very frequently readers in childhood and have remained readers. They may now specialise in their reading because they've done a degree and they've on the climate change degree perhaps and they've specialized but they're probably also reading fiction beyond or reading politi political uh, you know newspapers or whatever uh, reading online reading off so they're probably not just reading climate change but they're also wider awake members of society who are conscious of the, the broader brief in which climate change sits so that is not that yes it, it makes a lot of sense uh, that so there is no restriction as to what genre of books one should read in, in one should read what one enjoys yeah so i might enjoy something you enjoy something else and we've got to respect their choice and support their choice so if a child age six is reading a lot of comic books i don't want to take the comic books away and say you know read a book with no pictures in yeah. i want to say if that's where he is now i'm going to support him in that place and gradually he will read both comic books and novels and well, indeed you and i may read manga Sometimes, you know, we may read magazines which are full of kind of comic style information and we're adults. So yeah. we're still making choices. What, what about encouraging reading widely, wide reading, uh, reading a, a, a variety of genres? For example, today you read sci-fi, tomorrow you read a spy thriller, and the next day you, re you read about politics and international relations, economics, religion, and so on and so forth. Does that, does that help um, uh, shape somebody's perspective or they scatter, sort of uh, make somebody uh, mentally uh, unstable because of reading those different, an avalanche of ideas? I, I think that readers have rights. And one of the readers' rights is to have their own desire to read what they want to read, respected by and supported, not just respected, and supported by the educators they're working with. So some readers might choose to dip into lots of different interesting things they're interested in. Others might find that the graphic novel or, or um, dystopian novels are a particular interest to them. 
And so they stay there. They might not stay there for years. They might stay there for six months. But they then move on to something else. And they might be nudged on to something else if they were kind of in a reading rut perceived by their teacher. The teacher might nudge them and say, you know, you could try this. I found this really interesting. This was hilarious. I know you like funny stories. Maybe you want one of these too. So the, always the teacher is nudging, but giving choice and respecting the reader's rights to make their own final choices, albeit supported by a, a well-read teacher. This is very much clear. Um, the next thing that I, I would like to ask you is um, the definition of reading culture, for example. Um, how can we define somebody who has the habit of reading, who has a culture of reading, for example? Uh, does it mean somebody who reads, um, let's say, um, a 500-page novel per day or in two days? How, how do you, for example, expertly define uh, the habit of reading? I don't know that. Well, the habit of reading is to persist in the activity itself. But it isn't only to read solitarily. So I might have a magazine in front of me and I'm reading something. But then as soon as I'm halfway through, I'm thinking, well, I don't agree with that. And I'm sitting at the kitchen table and my husband's there with a coffee and I'm going, would you believe it? They're arguing this. Because to be a reader is to make meaning from text, but to expand your understanding of that meaning in interaction with others. So you're socially engaged in what you're reading because it means something to you. Does that make sense? So we do solitarily engage in reading, but critically, we also socially engage in reading. So to have the habit of reading is to have the habit of engaging frequently. That doesn't, you know, depending on age, it'll be a different amount of reading you're able. And it'll also depend on the book. If, if you've lent me a book on neuroscience and you're insisting I read it and I'm trying, I'm going to be slower than I would be if I read a novel that I was choosing myself that was, you know, pitched at each phase I'm, you know, interested in. Yeah. So much will depend on the context and the text, mm. but the but the act of reading and the kind of um, reading beha the habit is one of making sense of text, of chosen text, in, in terms of reading for pleasure, and then discussing it with others, debating it, yeah. popping it. Okay. I recently finished my university. Um, we're still waiting for a result. And uh, whenever an exam was approaching, all of us, the state of our mental health deteriorates simply because of the um, books and pages and ideas and concepts that we're bombarded with. Uh, and the fear, mm -hmm. that if you don't read hard, if you don't read a lot, you, you may fail. You might fail the exam. Uh, we feel like we're being cornered. We're being, we feel like we're being trapped into a corner um, by our lecturers, by our professors simply because they prescribe, uh, they sort of force us to read what they want us to read. Do you think the university system could work better if students are allowed to read for pleasure? I don't know if that makes sense. No, it makes good sense. I mean, at one level, nobody can prevent you reading for pleasure. You can go to bed 20 minutes later, should you choose. You could read less of the academic books that are assigned to your, you know, exams. Equally, we all have to make choices at different times in life. There'll be times when as a young mum or a young dad, there's almost no time to read for pleasure because you're trying to cope with the job and feeding or earning the money to feed the baby and cope with the baby waking up in the night, etc. So that as in our reading lives, we'll go up and down the amount of time we can assign to reading for pleasure. And I think that's just normal, as it were. Some readers will... Uh, as Margaret Mackey describes them, be flow readers who always know they're flowing on from one book to the next, never kind of stopping, or so having very few breaks. But other readers, as she describes them, would be event readers who read, because I'm going to Japan on holiday, because I'm going to Sicily, I'm going to read about the country and find places we want to visit. And so we, we read with a particular purpose because of a particular event. And an event reader is also really for the exams, you're reading with a very focused sense of that. And part of that, you may be choosing to read a particular piece for the exam because you think that question is coming up, so you're reading a paper that relates to it. Now, some of that is not quite set. You know, you want the exam, you want to get the result, yeah. so you are you may not be loving every moment, but you did choose to engage in it. Yeah. yeah. So to some extent, there's that kind of, it's not recreational I'm lying on an armchair or in an armchair with a cup of coffee, but it's 
purposeful. And I think there's a lot of overlap between choosing to read and purposefully reading things that are going to help you. You know, one, one you could argue one's functional and the other one's recreational. But I bet at some point during the exam reading of the papers, you quite enjoy. That was an interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Oh, that's a good point he's making. And so there's overlap. It's not, you know, um, they're not two sides of a, you know, well, they are potentially two sides of the same time, but they're not unrelated. Yeah. So, so the, there's no problem for professors to be fixing uh, or prescribing books and papers and uh, uh, sort of uh, stuff like that for students to read. Because that's developing the skill of the, the area, the conceptual understanding of the chosen area, isn't it? So if I'm teaching history at a secondary school, I'm going to be expecting the young people to read around the history and I'm going to have particular history books I'm setting. Else, how am I going to get them to get their heads around it? Yeah. I can't give them the knowledge through my vo voice. I need them to read, to discuss, to debate, to write. So I'm developing the skills of history there. But if one or two of them get interested in that particular period, uh, between the wars or something, then they're very interested in what was happening and, uh, on the land and how the land was being uh, reused, etc. Then they might go and find something else that they're interested in choosing to read themselves. So what might have been begun as an extrinsic reading, you will read this, it's a book that's assigned for history, might become or lead to intrinsic interest in the area and their own desire to read a novel about that period of time in history. Do you mean, so they're not inextricable, these two kind of setting it for the skill and developing it for the will. There's overlap. Well, we, we, we're running out of time. I think we got less than 10 minutes uh, to go. Let, let me put this question uh, to Professor. Uh, we have some English students that we teach here in Kano. We have an English academy called Kampa English Academy, and we teach um, adults um, English and children as well. Um, this question is directly related to teaching and learning English. Uh, how could you relate um, reading culture to the area or the field of teaching and learning English? Uh, I think if you're, if you're running, if you're teaching a class of young people who are trying to learn to speak English, they're emerging into the English language, as it were, but they also have their home language, as it were. Uh, so we'd want to be encouraging those young people or adults to be reading in their own language, uh, as well as potentially trying to tackle some texts within English. Uh, so we don't, we don't, they need to be able to read things that they can access with ease and with pleasure. And therefore, they must be able to be choosing to read in their home language. We'd certainly want to support that yeah. to create a cult. What, what do you exactly mean by reading in their own um, local language? Well, whatever texts are available to them in their own um, you know, language, then we'd want to be able to them to choose from those. Because you have got an English class and you're trying to teach the skills of English in that class, but but they are going to be more assured in their own language, whatever language they speak, whatever language, so whatever language they can easily read that they've you know uh, for many years been using. So that what we call in English their home language, yeah. and so um, we'd want to encourage them to read in their home language for pleasure, but to be studying English and potentially get the skill over time to be able to choose to read in an English uh, text as well. Yeah. So, so walking towards the yes. reading in English, but not seeing it as better or worse, just different. It would be like me learning if I'm going in a, in a French class. Yeah. I've got to learn to, to read French before I can really easily access it, but I can speak English and read English and be relaxed in that space. Got to be relaxed to want to read for pleasure. It's it's my space. Mm. Yeah, so I want to be downtime, informal, low key, not feeling tested, which may creep in in a teaching context if I'm teaching English to colleagues who have second language. Yeah. So in in this case, you are trying to say that there is no problem academically and professionally and linguistically translating. Um, the English language, the English words and sentences into, uh, in this case, our language, Hausa language. You are totally in support of that? Yes, and I would want to encourage those students to read what they choose to read in whatever language they feel most comfortable in. Because 
in the end, it's about choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I'm going to sit here with a book that's really difficult for me to read, it's not going to give me that comfortable or inspiring or imaginative world because I'm struggling to make the imaginative world out of the words. Whereas if I can read in my own language and I can imagine those worlds, then great. But, and yeah. the, the both languages, with a lot of research to suggest, that both languages will be working together to support yeah. that young person. So let's have both. We have in England now in, in the UK, we have many Welsh schools where Welsh is the um, medium in which is taught. Uh, and it's important that the young people who are um, uh, coming, going to those schools, and many of them, are Welsh. And they speak Welsh at home, and some of them don't. Some speak English at home. Well, so Welsh, they need to have Welsh is not a variety of the English language? Well, it is its own language. It has its own uh, language itself. So, yes, no, it's a very different piece that you're going to be. So it's two different, and we do a lot of work in Wales, um, because the OU works across the nations. Four nations of, of uh, the UK. So when we're doing work in Wales, we're always working with colleagues who are translating into Welsh for us. Yes. Okay. But we've been told that um, the Welsh people are also the native speakers of the English language. So that is not true? Well, there's, many of them speak both. But it is a language that deserves respect and is used by many Welsh speakers. So uh, there are Welsh schools now, Welsh speaking schools, Welsh medium schools, and then English schools in Wales that teach welsh mm. so there's a, a rich mixture all right so uh well let me ask you this final question about um teaching english uh, what advice do you have for me uh, an english teacher and my colleagues um regarding reading culture and teaching the english language what can you say about it okay some advice around the reading culture i would say share your reading life with your students Uma. i'd say um you know, take the books that you read or magazines that you read or comics or newspapers that you read in and show them you are a reader. Reflect not a perfect reader, not a kind of on a pedestal reader, but just an ordinary reader who reads a lot of different things. Yeah, uh, You're not trying to be, you're not trying to get them to be you. You're trying to get them to share what it is they read. So one of the things I would do as a teacher in your context would certainly be share my reading life. Uh, maybe show them on a visual the different kinds of things, like a collage of the different things you read in the day, online reading, offline reading. Helping them have a broader view of reading than simply book bound or simply studying in a school, but help them see that we are reading a wide range of different kinds of texts. So that would be one. But I'd certainly want to encourage you uh, to read to your students if you're trying to develop culture of reading you're trying to culture is a, a group of colleagues who are engaged in different kinds of practices together an ethos a way of working different uh, routines in part so we want to create a, an environment in which we are readers not me and you but we create that kind of collective collaborative ethos in which we journey together as a community of readers and some of us love graphic novels and some of us love something different and some of us love talking about it and some don't like talking about it too much at all we are unique individuals who, who are readers in different ways some people in your class uh, may like to read the end of the story before they read the beginning now i never do that but that doesn't make it wrong or right we're allowed to do what we want to do yeah. we're readers all right um well, fi finally um is social media and the internet are social media and the internet to blame uh, for the decline in reading culture globally and then in the West, particularly? I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to comment globally if I'm really truthful because I don't know enough research evidence around that. But wh whatever we blame, we're in the situation we're in, yeah? which is there is a massive decline in both uh, literacy levels post-pandemic and in attitudes to reading. So in the last OECD data for our uh, uh, 11 year olds, 10 and 11 year olds, we saw uh, only 45% of those young people across 57 countries love reading. Not even half of them are loving reading. And 18% say they don't like it. No, thank you very much. Don't want to do that. And they don't quite say hate, but they pretty come close to it. Yeah, I don't like reading. So we've got a really serious situation on our hands when we know that choosing to read being a recreational reader loving it reading for pleasure those make a difference 
to children's attainment, as I've said, and well-being. And yet we've got this horrendous situation where young people are not enjoying it. So we have a responsibility to attend to the motivational side of reading, not just keeping pushing at the skill sets, but develop the desire. That way, there is more hope in children beginning to practice reading in their own time because they want to. They don't see it as practice. They see it as finding out what happens next. Will the witch get him? Or whatever it is. Yeah? Their desire is driven by narrative or by information or by curiosity, not by sir or miss telling me I have to do it for homework because that will develop my skills. Well, that's an interesting so, desire that we want to foster. Yeah, well, yeah. Professor Teresa Kremin, thank you very much indeed for taking your precious time to be on the show. What can you say about the interview and my style? I've been very engaged. Thank you very much. It's been very conversational. So that's lovely. Thank you. Appreciated it. Yeah, on behalf of everyone that has contributed to the production of the show, uh, Abdul Rashid Hussain and Muhammad Abu Bakr Muhammad for the for helping us with the laptop to record the show. My name is Umar Isa. Then to go say goodbye and see you very soon, Professor. Thank you once again, and I hope you will be uh, back very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. All the best. <laughs>